All right, let's see what y'all got. Ready? From it. I think so. I think I'm All ready. All right. Now. One, two, three. Oh, wow. Peace, peace. This is Just Blaze. I'm in Austin for a special episode with my homie, the one and only, the Queen, Caddy Custis. Our guest today is a hip hop icon and a true friend. He's one half of the legendary duo UGK, and he is Texas hip hop to his core. He's worked with the best, loved across the industry, and has a whole lot of stories to tell. Can Caddy and I come up with a shoe that this Lone Star legend will love? Will our take on his royal regal vibe inspire this renowned sneakerhead? Let's find out. Welcome to Fresh Pit. Make some noise for Bun B, please. Josh, what's up? What up, Caddy? How are you? OG himself. Thank y'all for having me. OK, so before we even get started and before I forget, we do a sneaker check. OK. So I got to see what you came in with. So let me see what you got on your feet. Those the Tiffany Coles. Yes. Yeah, what them you got? fresh. Oh, I got some, you know, Louis Vuittons. See how she says, I got some Louis Vuittons. You know, I have to step out a um, little bit. They're very casually. Oh, my son, we, we hang out in these. Um, This is uh, the Jordan Becker 8s. That was crazy. No. All right, yeah. so um, yes, um, sneaker check. This guy has just outclassed all of us. Yeah, he did. No, no. Man. Yeah, he yeah. did, especially with that back tab in the back. That's crazy. No, no. I like that. So um, let's talk about it. Are you ready to see what we've made for you? I didn't know it was gonna happen this quick. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was gonna take. Can I take a sip? Because I want to. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Are you ready? Because I want to get into it. <laughs> I see a lot of nice work around here, too. Woo, so. Thank you. A lot I of nice, appreciate it. I really it. like the blazes. Very clean. Oh, very clean. thank you. Thank you. The Just Blazes? Like the Just Blazes. Remember we gave him that name last year? I know, right? <laughs> Just Blazes. That's cool. That's cool. So. All right. Let's see what y'all got ready? from me. I think so. I think I'm ready. All right. Now. One. Two. That's crazy. <laughs> okay, that is on. beautiful. You can touch them. Wow. You like the Laces House trilogy? That's crazy. That's crazy, right? Oh, Brock Lake's lot. I love this back hit. Ooh. Yeah. Somebody must have told y'all fours are my, my favorite. Ah. Oh, no, we know things. We know yeah. things. We did like a month, like, research everything just to dissect everything about you. It's beautiful UGK colorway classic. Yes. UGK colorway. Absolutely. Right and dirty. This is amazing. Woohoo. <laughs> wow, thank y'all so much. Yo, this is crazy. Absolutely. The, the logo, like, this is bananas. Absolutely. Now, we knew I'm that was going to be it. one of the best parts of the shoe. Absolutely. But there's so many other small details. So, the diamond on the tongue. Mm hmm. All right, what is that going to be about? What is that going to represent? Diamonds up against the wood? Mm -hmm. Diamonds and wood. That's love. I love it. <laughs> I love it. So, so Diamonds and Wood um, is, um, is a song on a Rotten Dirty album. But when you talk about the production, right? So Pimp had put together a couple of players. First of all, we were, um, we were very young. We were working on the Super Tight album, the album that preceded Rotten Dirty. And we kept trying to get this, this sample he was trying to get it right um, yeah. when he was trying to make a record. It was a meter sample. And he was like, man, it's just, it's not working right as a sample. I need, I need right. Leo Nocitelli to come and play on this. So we were young, young, arrogant kids. Just the nerve to think that one of the greatest guitar how players old in the world. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you? That would have so? been 96, so maybe 23, 24 okay. at that time. Wow. Okay. To have that kind of foresight, though. Yeah, we've been like 23, 24. Yeah, well, that ain't, that, again, that isn't me. That's right. all pimp. You right. know what I'm saying? Right. From a musical aspect, mm -hmm. everything was pimp. Um, but we reached out to him, and he actually came and played on a few songs. And then for Riding Dirty, pimp had an idea of putting uh, a group of musicians together to create all the music that he wanted to right. have for the album. And so Diamonds Up Against the Wood is basically the band that he put together, their interpretations of, of Munchies for Your Bass. Okay. By Bootsy Collins. And so if you listen to the end, the outro of Riding Dirty, that's like the full session right. of all the players playing. And then Diamonds and Wood is his, is him taking the best pass from this instrument and that instrument and putting them all together and creating like the perfect loop. So he okay. created the loop that he couldn't, loops that he couldn't really get to work in real time. 
he would get with musicians and like recreate them and then piece them together. Okay. He was years ahead of his time. That's dope. Yeah, that just messed my head up. <laughs> Cause I thought I was doing something at 20. <laughs> but you were, 20, 20, you were. I, I was, but I wasn't doing that. <laughs> um, so the way we put this shoe together, we started um, by dipping the whole thing in dye, right? And the thing with dye is different, um, different uh, materials will take, will take differently, right? So like rubber might take one way. Um, leather's gonna take differently. Plastic's gonna take differently. But we want, we knew that the tone that we wanted to have, which was, uh, a wine purple combined with the yellow. And, um, Beautiful. that represents royalty, right? You are an underground king. Obviously. Thank you. <laughs> but I feel like a lot of us, right? Like a lot of us put things out in the hopes that what we put out comes back to us, right? Yes. Um, for you, when did you realize that it had come back to you? It's a great question. Um, because we spent a lot of our early years, like not really recognized, like our record company didn't really want to give us substantial music video budget so we had right. very few music videos right um they never put us put us on a tour bus on promo so a lot of the ground that we covered was our own personal scraping right we right. were very much a word of mouth group um and there was there was cultural and regional detachment between us and our record company jive in new york of course so it wasn't until riding dirty when you know pimp was like look we don't want any cash advancement we want equipment we don't want any money just give us the equipment to, to make the music and right. give us creative control. And so right. that became Riding Dirty, the album that fully, clearly um, described who we are and what we represent. That's dope. And so that being a seminal album, to have this shoe represent that is is crazy. So um, in Diamonds and Wood, one of the references you make is Bang and Screw. Yes. I want your top five screw tracks. Screw was a big, uh, big fan of Sibo. Okay. okay. Um, um, so any Sibo song you would hear on a screw tape right. all day. Um, he was a big fan of Above the Law, so you would hear Black Superman. Very, very, um, very, very prominent song on right. many different screw tapes. Definitely. Um, but then also Tupac, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Like um, the older Tupac, though. Right. Like... Um, Young Black Male and stuff like that. Right. Like that first early right. Tupac. The early joints. Yeah. And then, you know, Screw every now and then um, would hit a little reggae every now and then. Ooh. So you might hit some um, some Steel Pulse. Right. You know what I'm saying? One of the things that we talk about in, is, in my inner circle is uh, when did your third eye open? Mm -hmm. For me, it opened when I saw We Can't Be Stopped uh. and saw that album cover and I was like... All right, I don't know what's happening here, but this dude is, this little guy has his eye hanging out. <laughs> um, can you talk to us about just the, the influence of uh, the Kettle Boys? I mean, look, you know, Rap A Lot Records were, you know, literally some of the first people creating hip hop to be sold, right? So there right. were a lot of people that were, were actually rapping in the clubs. Guys like R.P. Cola, Willie D before he was a ghetto boy, right. um, Romeo Poet. A lot of guys were known for, Billy D for that matter, known for rapping in the club, but they weren't necessarily making music. Right. So right. when Jay Prince started Rap A Lot Records, um, their first record was Car Freak. And it was a very small independent record, but um, it made some noise in the city. And, it, you know, they just kept growing as a company. And when they hit upon mine playing tricks on me, they right. knew they had a record and they had a system um, that put them in the best possible position to be received by the world. Right. And at that time, they were Houston's biggest cultural export. Right. Uh. Um, the same thing with Screw. That was a big thing about Screw because this was something that was being created solely in Houston. So right. all cultural references, anything photo wise, anything you heard or saw would make sense to a Houstonian first and foremost. Right. You know, we grew up listening to, to East Coast hip hop. We didn't know what Buck 50 meant, you know what I'm saying, God body. So we would have to do research to try to figure out, make right. phone calls right. and figure out what that meant. And so this right. was now your turn right. to do, do the work, go right. home and do the work. And so Screw Tape started as just like a regular mixtape where he was selling 
you know, just mixtapes as typical DJs would sell. Right. So you could pay one price for a mixtape. You could pay a little bit more and give him a list of names that he would shout you and your crew out. And for a higher price, you could actually get on the mic <laughs> and, okay. and shout yourself out. You know Bro, what I'm saying? That's dope. And so those shout outs eventually turned into freestyles from different people. And then instead of me and my boys shouting out our neighborhood, they started rapping to different people. I think C-Note from the Body Boys was one of the first people to, to freestyle on a screw tape. And then it just became this big Southside thing. That's crazy. Like, it wasn't just freestyles and everything. Right. It was literally like letting you know what was happening. It was social wow. commentary. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I mean, it was like CNN, like right. breaking news, so-and-so just got robbed right. last night wow. kind of a thing. People always talk about, oh, NWA was the ghetto CNN. Well, it kind of was, right? Well, like, it was just CNN. Everybody making hip hop was from the ghetto mm-hmm. right. at that time. So you both have relationships with Rockefeller. Is there any stories that you guys can tell me that's off the record that haven't been told before? Right around the same time, I... Uh, get a prank phone call that leads to me working with Jay-Z. <laughs> That's literally how it happened, right? Right around that same time, they called me to the office and they played me three records. And one of those records was Big Pimpin'. It wasn't out yet, it was still off, it wasn't even mastered, it was, wasn't mixed yet. Right. They just wanted to get my take on it. And then, yeah, yeah, but right? we don't get to there if it doesn't for this, right? Right, we exactly. We don't get there if it wasn't for that right. because I know that um, Hope was a big fan of this album. Clark was a big fan of, yes. of this album at that time. Right. And so right around the time, I imagine you got the call, probably within six months or so was when we got the call. And I thought the call was a prank <laughs> when they called me <laughs> because it was like... um. It was a block number, um, so it was an unknown It's call. always a block number, right? first and, of all. And then, um, you know, it was like, I was like, yeah, who's this? He was like, this is Jay-Z. And I'm like, yo, stop playing on my phone. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who they did, but stop playing on my right. phone. And I hung up. <laughs> and he called back, and I'm like, hello. He's like, yo, fam. And, you know, Jay-Z has probably one of the most distinct voices. Right. Yeah. And not just in hip-hop, but in the world. Like, And when I heard, I'm like, yo, I think this really is this nigga. <laughs> It's this nigga Jay Z. You know? <laughs> and so Pimp was like, well, ask him what he want, you know? <laughs> because there had actually been a call before, a lot of people don't know. Um, Pimp Z was called to be on um, just a week ago, the song with Too Short. Mm. Right. You know, Pimp had just moved to Atlanta. He just um, bought a new house and put a studio in it. And they called him to be on the record. And he was like, yeah, I'm down to do it. And they was like, well, you got to come to New York because. Jay-Z's not leaving right now, because this was like in the middle of the East Coast, West Coast right. beef. He was right. like, Jay's not leaving New York right now. And Chad was like, well, I ain't leaving Atlanta, so I guess it ain't gonna happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> But it did come back around. And so and anyway, all of that's to say that that's kind of how this Rockefeller call happens. Um, I was like, this is a great opportunity. You know, right. this was H to the Izzo time. Hove was like a very big deal in the music industry. Mm-hmm. Um, Pimp was not as excited about it um, because he knew that Jay-Z's audience wasn't our audience right. and that this song would be heard primarily by people that had no idea who we were or what, right. we, or what we were about. Right. And the track was so different. Like, I don't know if there's ever really been anything like it since. Yeah. You know different. what I'm saying? It was such a unique song and so different. And he was concerned that people would think that that was us, mm. right. that okay. that was our sound. Because even though it was a Tim track, it was not a Timberlands, it was not his sound. No, right. Tim has like, there's not no beatboxing. Right. Like, right. I don't right. consider you got a real Tim right. track <laughs> it's unless it's beatboxing. <laughs> That's when you get that real Tim. Because now he's excited. Right. right. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. Um, but it was literally a, um, a literal game changer. And I remember the first single was the Mariah single. Mm-hmm. And it didn't jump right. like mm-hmm. they wanted it to jump. And so this was... Big Pimpin' was a, I, I won't say a throwaway record, but it was more of a filler wow, okay. at the time. And that was supposed to be like a summer record. And then it was like, yeah, um, we think we're going to move it up a little. Okay. And then it was like, yeah, I think we're going to do a video for it. Big Pimpin' was the first music video budgeted for right. a million dollars. Wow. I came across a, uh, some research where um, Pimp C had on a mink coat and you guys were telling them, Jay-Z was telling them like, yo, take that off. It's, it's too, too hot. hot. Yeah. Like, so can you tell us a little bit more about that story? Yeah, so long story short, um, we started this video in Trinidad and Tobago. Pimp never made the flight. Um, 
So they never saw Pimp. They had never met Pimp until Big Pimp. I right. actually recorded my verse in New York. Okay. Right. Um, and, um, but they didn't, Pimp recorded at home. Right. Okay. And so they didn't meet Pimp until the day of the video shoot. And so me, I'm I'm a little bit low key, right? I'm not a, a flashy kind of guy, you know what I'm saying? Pimpsy is the absolute opposite. So <laughs> they've been around me and I didn't really have a lot of jewelry and I, you know, none of that stuff. And then Pimp pulled up in the new Benz drop top, you know, he was one of the first people to have the car. Um, right. Drove it down from Atlanta. Wow. Hopped out with, with the mink coats and put shit on. They were like, bro, we're on the beach. It's like 80 something <laughs> degrees. It's too, it's too hot for a mink coat. People were like, man, TV ain't got no temperature. Right. It right. just kept going. <laughs> you know, which is still one of the craziest things I've ever heard anybody ever say. But he was going to be who he was going to be in the moment. Regardless. And he knew this was a big moment. So he wanted to come in a big way. Right. Yeah, so he wanted to come in a big way. To honor that moment. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh oh. We made some custom memes. Oh, wow. <laughs> your, so feet got, your feet got me yeah. coach. Make some noise for me coach. Yeah. Yeah. This is bananas. <laughs> Shout out to my guy, Brian. Now, this is different. This is way different. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can you, can you stick it on there? Yep. I got it. Light work. I've, I've, I've had so some. So this is to honor Pimp C and oh, his meat coat wearing in the. Thank you. In the hundred degree weather. That's crazy. Now initially we had talked about like just stitching the the, uh, the mink on. Like where do we put the mink? And I'm like, no, it has to be a coat. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's yeah. literally. This is real mink. Like we we sourced these and we got some real mink and made these for no, you. No, this ain't fox. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. This ain't fact. This ain't come from Daniels. This is real. <laughs> <laughs> so you could take these on and off, you know, as you please That's and beautiful. rock them however you want to rock beautiful. them. Yeah. I, I will say this. The night that um, I actually went to New York and recorded this, I remember Jay was like, yo, I want to take you somewhere where the fish tastes like macaroni and cheese. Wow. And I was like, what was like, I was like, is it like, do they like crusted or whatever? <laughs> right. He was like, nah, nah. He was like, you know that feeling you get where you have like really, really good mac and cheese? He's like, you'll get that feeling from this fish. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and just that that way of describing the meal told me a lot about who I was about to be dealing with. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> In terms of this is not your average Joe. Right. You know what I'm saying? He looks at life a lot differently and he phrases himself accordingly. Um, and it has been over these years, I will say, um, there is only one hove in every sense of the word. The humor, wow. the, the business acumen, the talent, the uh, the vision, the the way the team is assembled to get specific things, specific goals achieved. He's one of one. Was Master P was another person. Yes. Just like that. Okay. Right. There was no if. There was always when. Okay. Right. Every time. It was always when. As soon as we get this, or as soon as we do this, then bam, we come in with this. And there was never a, we're not gonna do this. Or right. there was never like a different route. Right. It was like, no, nah, we finna do this. We gonna expand to this. And then this happens. And then we gonna hit this. And right. then that's where it is. But it was it's always about the culture working in their favor and leveraging the culture in their favor. Right. Well, it's, it's interesting because it, I mean, it takes a lot of balls to do that, but also like, we could all sit there and just try to will it into an existence, mm -hmm. but you have to have the product or the uh, the uh, the talent to back yes. it up. From what I saw, P understood that every room he walked into was going to underestimate him. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Based on his appearance, his language, whatever you might want to call it, he walked in assuming that they were going to think he was less smarter than he was, Mm. that he's less talented in terms of putting and organizing these things together and less of a businessman than they were. That's why they gave him such astronomical terms. Mm. Because <laughs> they never in their you know, wildest dreams thought that he would ever execute on that level. And wow. he repeatedly right. executed and right. he had to consistently right. pay out that money. Wow. You know? Right. I remember being around, uh, you know, uh, what he was doing in that era. And I didn't even catch it like it didn't make we just like the album covers right, right. <laughs> yeah, the album covers was we love the album covers it was eye candy you <laughs> yeah, know what i'm saying it right. it's what drew you in mm -hmm. right you know what i'm saying and p always started off the album with those soldier songs mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. that high level of in energy and damn near the entire roster so somewhere on that song you would find somebody you actually gravitated to and right. become a fan and that would be also where they would showcase 
the new artists. Right. Like one of the first songs on the album would be help showcasing right. some of the new artists. So it was all very strategic. Right. You know what I'm saying? Speaking of um, strategy and lanes, we talked about lanes a little bit earlier. You have, you, you occasionally um, jump in a lane as a uh, wedding um <laughs> host, right? Yeah, not a crasher. Not, <laughs> not, not a crasher. crasher. Not a crasher. No, no. You have a wedding lane. That's why we wanted to. Uh, we, we wanted to represent ask, that. I kept here. trying to figure out this cake. Right. Yeah. Right. I it's the wedding cake. Out, um, I'm like, I mean, I know I'm a big dude and I like desserts, <laughs> <laughs> but it couldn't have been to that extent. Right. But somehow you found this new lane. Um. So it's always a trip. Well, one when we get this call because. When we started getting this call, I was like, is this real? Do people really want this song? Because right. the song is kind of like almost anti. Right. Marriage, Keep it you know? Don't yeah, do it. Don't saying? do it. Don't do it. Right. Uh, but the video, right? People want that connection right. to, the, to the video. And so at first I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this. That. Well, they're paying this. What, just for the song? Just for <laughs> that song? I'm like, I guess we can make it work, you know? <laughs> So, just speaking of uh, interesting ways to keep the legacy going, there's been so many acts who are legendary acts who meant so much to our culture. Tribe lost Fife. Yes. You know, De La just lost Dave. Um, Run DMC lost Jay. Um, the Beasties lost MCA, right? You lost Pimp, but somehow you kept, you, you kept the show going. Did you have a moment where you felt like maybe you shouldn't and then you decided you had to keep it pushing? Well, we dealt with this situation twice. The right. first time was when he went to prison. Uh, right. Right? So that was three and a half years of trying to perpetuate the, t the music, the, the group, but most importantly, keep his name alive, you know, so right. that when he came home, he was still viable as an artist. But when he passed away, it was a lot different because... It was very emotional for me for a while. You know, I was very depressed. Um, was drinking a lot. I was drinking like a fifth of Hennessy a day. Wow. Um, yeah, people found me, a good friend of the family found me wandering the streets drunk. I had broken my knuckle, punching a train, I tried to fight her. Just a very, very uh -huh. low, low moment in my life. And my wife got me back into church and got me back, um, you know, with a stronger spiritual connection. And nice. it repurposed everything for me, right? right? Because a lot of what, I was dealing with, quite frankly, was some woe is me type shit. Right. You know, like feeling sorry for myself. Right. right. You know, and then I had to take into consideration what other people right. in his life were going through, his mother, his wife, his children, you know. Right. And, and so we, you know, we, I, you know, what's the proverbial phrase? You pull yourself up by your bootstraps, whatever it is, you know, right. however you frame it, we got back up, we got back to it, but with a renewed purpose, right? right? A renewed understanding of what it is I was actually doing in real time and how it needed to be done. Right. And we've been doing it now, you know, going on 16 years right. of representing for him. And the beautiful thing is, is that I don't have to carry this torch by myself and I've never had to carry it by myself because right. the, the, the people, the family, the base, they miss him in the same way that I do. So when, I have those moments where I honor him on stage. They feel it just like I do. They yes. want to lift him up. I love but him. also, you might recognize that map. Oh, that's crazy. That's the OG map from the Almanac back in the day. Yes, yep. Port Arthur. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what life was like pre uh, Bun B, pre all that. When, that's crazy. So Port know, Arthur, Texas is a very small industrial town in Southeast Texas. A large majority of the people live at or, um, you know, around poverty level, quite frankly. Mm. There's not a lot of opportunities for people there. And so we really, you know, a, a big part of us wanting to succeed was to make a better way for ourselves and find a better life for ourselves. Right, right, right. right. absolutely. So when it comes to your sneakers. Yes. How, how do you feel about them? How did we do? I think you did an amazing job. I think for one, the colorway, Awesome. You killed it. The diamonds and wood references, bananas. I see what the cake is now, the Rockefeller. <laughs> but I'll be very honest. I've had a lot of people um, try to make customized shoes for me. Shout out to Nari Got Soul. He's, he's an amazing customizer in Houston. Does some great work. And even Young Noble from the Outlaws sent me some Chuck Taylors. Right. And um, they were airbrushed. They're beautiful work. Um, shout out to Kit Styles in Houston. Our airbrush king. He's designed many, many shoes for me. Okay. But it's this logo on the back, this 3D embossed 
nice. you know, like it's not a patch, it's actually constructed. Right. It's been cut out where the letters are and where the crown is. It's been beautifully executed. It's affixed very well. So I've had some customs before where we lost a couple of right. a couple of things along you the way. Things along, right, we lost right, some right. things along the way. But right. I mean this this shoe. You looks will not beautiful. lose anything on this yeah, shoe. Yeah, I mean we yeah. can't even and we can't even talk about the fur. Like yeah. I mean, I don't even know if we can really even do that justice on this camera if y'all can see because you can't touch it. You, you can't, can't feel it. it. Right. That's dope. This this is not rabbit. And the fact that it's a coat, right? This is right. not rabbit. Like, this is just, real shit. You can pull it off, right? You like, know, nah, just the idea of it being a, an actual coat. Like the thought that you guys put into presenting these products and then I can only imagine the 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 work that it takes to get this done. Yeah, it's and, a lot of work. And a lot you, of work. But you guys, you know, doesn't take you a year to do a season. So <laughs> so you guys are turning this product around. Um in, in great time without cutting any quarters in quality. Have you thought about doing this for a living? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do do it for a living. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for Bumble, please. Bro, so before you officially break out and make your next move, I have to, I have to ask you honestly, how did we do? Now uh, you did great, man. I would say probably nine and a half out of ten, literally. I mean, okay. I mean, uh, other than just having like my name on there somewhere. You know but we saying? so here's the thing is we thought about that right but I I, I think UGK is better though it's a better representation well you know what we we we, we talked about putting the name oh up well, here. no but, do, but you know what I'm bugging I'm bugging we got the Trillo G laces exactly so we got a you ten still out of ten so it's a ten out of ten it's a ten out of ten thank you that was <laughs> thank that you. was a half I, I'm we, flipping on that because here's the thing is that you think about it right whenever you see like a, a collab with Nike and such and such or Adidas and such and such they don't have their name it may be an allusion to something. Right, like right. Nothing. So that's the only reason why I didn't put like four Bun B, like or or Bun. Thank, thank you for not being gaudy. <laughs> thank you for we, being we reserved and classy. Thank you. We try to think. That's exactly the point. We try to keep things factory and classy. Keeping it thank classy. you for coming through and coming hang out, hang out with us and talk to us. Happy to be a part you, of season two. And we love you. Man. Bring me back for season twelve. Oh, I know. I know y'all ain't going. We will nowhere. be here. <laughs> we will be here. Salute, peace, y'all.